Don't tell your mother. Kiss one another. Die for each other. We're cold for the summer. So what's up, guys? So, as you know, I was doing the last couple of weeks. I've kind of been on this weird um, tangent, I guess you could call it, on men's rights and radical feminism. Now, my views on either are that they are reactionary. I consider radical feminism to be uh, it gets kind of social justice warrior-y and quite frankly I think in most cases I would have to disagree with certain individuals and actually say that it actually is reactionary and not revolutionary because many aspects of radical feminism do kind of put off this vibe of what I would consider fem almost like a feminist nationalism. Um, and quite frankly, it's, it's almost, to me, as reactionary, if not equally as reactionary, as the men's rights movement. And I've actually openly stated, and I openly defend my, my beliefs, that the men's rights movement is also reactionary, at, you know, uh, with a good sense of... Um, you know, on a good sense of that. The men's rights movement, in my opinion, is, you know, has this this very aura of of men's, uh, of male superiority, um, denial of male privilege, even though it practically, you know, it, it oozes of, ma you know, this typical first world is male privilege, which I'll get to in a minute, and this idea of how uh, and, and essentially what I would consider male nationalism. Now, it's also one of those things where, equally as so, radical feminists, you know, um, I would consider to be, have this very, very typical nature of being first worldist. And... Anita Sarkeesian is one of those people. Her and Zoe Quinn are very, you know, I, I would argue are actually very first worldist. They don't really typically tend to focus on a lot of the female issues that are going on in the third world. They do on some occasions, but more and more, and, uh, more and more, let me use a more articulate term. Increasingly, they are they seem to be focusing primarily on issues that go on within the the cyber world, the internet, you know, I mean, I guess rightfully so, that's where they hail from, but essentially their, their intentions seem to be more focused on women in the first world, and, you know, this certain, uh, I, I don't know how to exactly put this you know, but they no, but they basically don't really seem like they put much of an emphasis on uh, issues going on with women in the third world. They're too concerned about propping up their own, um, you know, idealist, you know, their own idealism, uh, you know, of women in the first world, particularly in the United States. And so it it gets to be one of those things where I consider that to be very first worldist as well and I consider it to be reactionary um, but essentially what I was what I'm trying to get at is that I, this spiel came about when I because I keep seeing going around social media this thing about talking about how um, this 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 guy and this girl um, you know it's this poster where they say well Jake was drunk Josie was drunk they both they hooked up. Josie uh, could not consent. The next day, Jake was charged with rape. Blah 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 blah. So and they're saying, well, wait a second. If Drake, Jake was dr drunk, he couldn't consent either. Or is that how? Uh, or is that not how equality works? And the problem with this is that it's very, this is a very horrible straw man argument. It's a very sham argument. It's a if anything, it is. You know, in, it is whether intentionally or not, it is basically uh, committing, you know, ad hominem against this particular issue of basically 
sexual violence against women, as well as the fact that this can be considered a red herring as it's trying to distract from the issue as well. It's trying to focus the attention not on the, you know, the fact that neither one of them consented. It's trying to basically focus on the fact that she could get, not give consent, but because he was drunk, he couldn't consent either. So blah, 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 you know, men, men's rights logic, you know, that male privileged logic, it's like, they, it must be, well, he was raped too. Which is just stu stupid on so many fucking levels. And it, it does. It distracts away from the actual point that the, that the poster was about. And then try, and in basically trying to, to steer it the other, you know, steer it in the, you know, male privileged direction saying, well, hey, how could he commit a crime? He was drunk too. It doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter that the, if, if the woman basically is not in the, let's put it this way, neither one of them should have done anything, but shit happens, but at the same time, if she cannot consent, it's technically rape. I am a big advocate of this, not, well, not a big advocate, but I am a, per, a I have this belief that if he, that if she could not give legal consent, because she was not in the capacity to give that consent, then neither one of them should have been doing anything. Now, of course, the male privileged arguments would be, well, he couldn't give consent either. Yes, but he probably had an intention of at least doing something, whether he was consenting or not, whether he was friggin' logically minded or not. Because technically, one of the things about drinking is that it gets rid of your inhibitions. It gets rid of your, uh, you know, it basically get, it gets rid of your um, discretions. And so, in doing so, in the, you know, I'm trying not to do this without trying to sound um, biased or sexist. But, essentially, if he, if he had a, a, an instant thought about... Oh, she's pretty fucking hot. I'm gonna go fucking bang her. But she wasn't in the capacity of doing so. Well, then, technically, you're having me, and you know, you should basically, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to get at. The point is, it's wrong. You know, it's wrong pretty much any way you slice it on how it went down. Yes, should they have exercised their better discretions, both of them? Yes. But it also, this whole fucking meme puts, this, puts on this victim blaming on women. And that is very, a very male privileged position. It's a very fucking sexist position. And frankly, it's just a very vile position. It is just an absolute, it's a fucking straw man attack. It's a fucking ad hominem. And it's a, and frankly, it, it's, a, it's just a bullshit argument. I'm fucking tired of, of all this stuff where it's like, you know, the man is be being accused uh, of rape and he's trying to get out of it saying, well, I was drunk too. So? That does not signify anything. And quite frankly, even in today's judicial standards, you probably aren't going to get, that probably isn't going to be a very valid argument when it comes to being in a court of law, nor has it really ever been a very poignant argument in a court of law. So, it, it's just stupid all the way around. But getting away from this distracting topic and focusing on, you know, a real issue, I was talking about how I view men's rights and radical feminism as basically same crap, different can, in that they are reactionary, they're first worldist, and frankly, counterproductive and counter-revolutionary towards any form of gender equality. Let me first start on the men's rights issues, since that's kind of, since, you know, that's why I need to kind of hash out some things anyway. Only then am I, will I actually give the counter argument of on my issue, my same issues with the, with radical feminism, and then we'll move towards a general 
conclusion on this. So men's rights reactionaries, um, men's rights reactionaries, I, I personally call them this because revolution is not fought by attacking another side of the proletariat. If you are a revolutionary, you are fighting for the you are you acknowledge that you have privilege and you acknowledge that there's equality that we need to get to not by raising male privilege or male rights not by lowering it but by staying staying where it is right where it is while also fighting for the advocacy of trying to achieve uh, female rights through the act of realizing that we have to tear down this system of exploitation so essentially try to overcome our prejudices so let me get to that and I will get to that in a minute but essentially it's this this reactionism that comes from men's rights movement and these you know uh, radical um, uh, gender uh, these radical gender nationalists as I would call them it, it's it's simply them fighting you know having these petty bourgeois prejudices and because of this this is heavily dividing them it, it's the fighting it, it's the fighting of the of the genders the fighting of the sexes the war of the sexes as it's been called before the men are, the women are from venus men are from mars bs and it's this petty bourgeois the, uh, these petty bourgeois prejudices and these are these are prejudices that frankly need to be left behind for any form of gender equality, gender equalism, or any form of revolution to actually exist. Now, a lot of one of the problems I also have is a lot of these first worldist socialists, people that claim to be socialists but are really first worldist social democrats at, at most, and if not complete fucking reactionaries and fascists on the other uh, other side of it, who basically fight for men's rights, you know, fight for this men's rights BS, or are swayed by the, by the forked tongues of this movement and are neither progressive or revolutionary, but rather they are reactionary. To engage in bourgeois prejudices and attack other, again, and, and to lead attacks against fellow members of the proletariat, uh, you know, I will use in this particular instance a more non-biased argument would be Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn and their social social justice warrior bullshit that they pulled at the UN. Um, this, these attacks against fellow members of the proletariat is reactionary and counter-revolutionary and counterproductive to the progress of gender equality. And the men's rights movement is really no different th uh, than the BS that's being spewed by Sarkeesian and Quinn, as they drive a wedge further between men and women, and even further between gender equalists and unwittingly and ironically go against the principles of revolutionism, and, uh, especially if those MRMs claim to be revolutionary or socialist. The MRMs are also very terribly first worldist. They're only looking at themselves in terms of their positions while ignoring their privilege in Western society, much less their privileges of being a man in the first world. And while men, pretty much in every society, whether it's more forward thinking, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the United States and the Western world, or whether it's still stuck in the dark ages like Saudi Arabia um, essentially men just across the board hold privilege in just about every society but there are those that are still oppressed by the tyranny of first worldism and western imperialism and the fact that the men's rights movement does not really seem to at least not the ones that I've met there's probably been one per I think there's one person especially recently that I've talked to that focuses on that tends to focus a little bit more on this issue but more typically the ones that I've seen for the men's rights movement don't seem to really think that often or at all about male suffering in the third world at least at the hands of, of, of western imperialism and first worldism they don't think about that 
and they're not trying to prop it, you know, trying to propagate any sort of, you know, really helpful change in getting rid of the of the tyranny of and the privileges of the first world. So, always strikes me as a little odd. But now let's go more argumentatively, swaying to the other side of this. Let's go thinking a little bit more about the radical feminists and the feminine uh, and what I would call the uh, the f uh, female nationalism. Um, for instance, I talked just about Sarkeesian and Quinn, and frankly, their bombastic and ostentatious ramblings and attempts to appeal to emotion and ignorance of the greater world. Uh, they too commit the same reactionary elements that I have already accused the MRM of doing, which is straw manning, uh, straw manning, ad hominem, uh, and red herring arguments. They've committed the same actions. Argumentatively so, these social justice warriors are radical idealists, but they are they are first worldists who care very little about their fellow females um, in the third world and vi and the violence that goes on there. Again, a little bit more non-biasedly, we will look at s some forms of them that that do that will that will argue that yeah, we do we think about the women in the third in the third world yeah but you're not really thinking in terms of how to really how to really combat that it's like you know donating to charity is a bourgeois liberal element it doesn't really challenge the exploitive system it doesn't challenge that status quo really at all the signing of petitions the sign the protests Stuff like that. Those are all, those are all liberal elements. They don't challenge the status quo. But I, you know, I also hardly don't think that, you know, these are people that would, you know, take, you know, go, fl you know, fly to a third world country, take up arms, train, you know, female fighters, and, you know, fight for any sort of, you know, their social justice warrior causes over there, because they're not willing to do revolution. And that's why I argue that they are very first worldist, and that they don't really think about actually achieving any sort of goals of actually, you know, going to these third world countries and trying to directly help these people or directly meet with these people. I don't really see Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn really leaving the U.S. and going to, oh, say, Bangkok, where women are basically, you know, where, you know, women are basically treated worse off than women here in the US or even let's even think of another country Saudi Arabia where women you know are barely even given the right to drive much less even be thought of as anything other than property I don't really see you going to these countries and trying to sway the public opinion or sway the ruling class in those countries I don't really see you doing much there your main focus is on what you consider your primary idealism of gender equality in the first world, and in particularly in the United States. So, in the broad sense, Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn and fellow, you know, social justice warriors like them aren't really thinking in terms of, you know, of overall gender equality in the world. They're, think, they're not thinking in terms of revolution. They may try to claim that they're leading some sort of feminist revolution, but it's, they're not doing revolution. They're actually doing, I would have to say they're doing more harm to it and are actually more counterproductive than anything. That's why I claim that these are the indivi that these individuals, that this particular sect of it is freaking is frickin' reactionary. Um, their only focus is on the ideals of injustice towards females, most of which are not injustices nor relevant to the ideals of gender equality, and only seek to inflate their egos and attract attention towards themselves. Again, this is not revolutionary, and the fact that they blatantly attack members of the proletariat without much merit or sensibility, they can be neither called socialist nor progressive. 
They are reactionary social justice warriors who seek to drive a wedge gap between men and women and bring, up, uh, bring upon shame to gender equalists, especially revolutionary ones, and this harms everyone as well. So, personally, while well, biased to say that this is my opinion, because this is my opinion on this, but I find this to be a fair and balanced Marxist critical analysis of both MRMs and radical feminism. The social construct theory in terms of gender is almost as tumultuous as that of racism and identity politics, which distract us from revolution, yet is also a critical juncture in proletarianism, and this is all because of the way that classism has divided us and our ways of thinking, and instill in us the prejudices that we have for one another. This is not an accident. This is the grand design of capitalism and how the bourgeoisie seek to retain power and control over us by dividing us. Through this, they conquer us and retain their positions as the ruling class. We must learn to realize this and put aside our petty differences, for this is the link that keeps, capital, that keeps capitalism afloat by exploit, through exploitation, which prevents us from fighting them. I'm NorCal Nick leader of the revolutionist movement, and this has been NorCal Corner. Peace.